Welcome everyone. We are going to go ahead and get started. Our session today is supporting multilingual learners um, participation in secondary career and technical education programs. And I'm Diane Stair-Fenner. I'm president of Support Ed, and I just want to welcome you all here today. We're just so excited you're joining us on this very important topic. Hi, everyone. My name is Megan Gregoire Smith. I'm a multilingual learner coach for Support Ed. So in my work as an ML coach, I provide professional development on best practices for working with multilingual learners. Um, and I do a lot of work directly with educators to support them with the implementation of these strategies. And before I started working at Support Ed, I was an ELD teacher and ELD instructional specialist in Anne Arundel County Public Schools in Maryland. And I think I saw some names on the list um, from AACPS. So hi to all of you out there. I'm so excited to get to spend this afternoon talking about CTE for MLs with all of you. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Becca Lamore. I'm a CTE instructional coach in Renton, Washington. Uh, I'm, I primarily am in charge of supporting our new uh, teachers with mentoring and coaching, but also uh, all of the training for all of the teachers in our department. Um, and so what that has mean, uh, what that means for me this year is a really increased focus on supporting our multilingual learners. Uh, so I'm so excited to share some of the ways that we have uh, applied these ideas you're going to hear about in our classrooms. We are so excited to have Becca here with us today to be sharing um, some ideas directly from her district. So thank you so much, Becca. To accompany this webinar, we developed a resource hub that includes a padlet of resources and a PDF of the slides that we're presenting today. So throughout the webinar, you're going to hear us referencing materials, resources, research, all that's available on the Padlet. So anytime you see this little Padlet icon in the bottom right-hand corner of the screen, you know that resource is available on the Padlet. So I highly encourage you to bookmark this page so you can dig into these resources after the webinar. And I'll take a moment just to share what that looks like for you. So when you visit the resource hub, you'll come here and you're able to click on these buttons. So when you click Explore Session Resources, you'll find our Padlet. And then the follow along will allow you to download a PDF of the slides that we're going through this evening. So our objectives for this evening are to discuss the urgency around creating equitable pathways for ML enrollment in CTE programs and supporting MLs that are currently enrolled in CTE programs. Also to explore five instructional strategy recommendations to advance MLs equitable participation in CTE and to set a goal for effective CTE programming and instruction for MLs in your context. Now we're going to be talking through five instructional strategy recommendations, and these are really built out based on content from chapters three to six of our newest um, second edition of Unlocking Multilingual Learners' Potential Strategies for Making Content Accessible. So to get started, we'd really like to hear from you to get a sense of who our audience is today. So in the chat, in the chat if you could share your name, your role, and what you're hoping to learn. Um, on the screen, you see an example here. So hi, I'm Shannon. I'm an ELD administrator in a district that has recently been focusing on expanding CTE programs within the district. I came to this webinar for ideas for supporting MLs within our district CTE courses. So if you could share in the chat, we'd love to hear from you. Okay, it looks like we've got some ESL teachers, some parent and community, community engagement coaches, directors, principals, some graduate instructors, CTE teachers. That chat is just rolling really fast. I have We have so many different participants here today. So thank you all so much for joining us. Keep sharing. Um, we're so excited to have such a wide variety in our audience of teachers, administrators, coordinators. So thank you all so much for being here. So first, we're going to discuss the urgency around creating equitable pathways for ML enrollment in CTE programs and supporting MLs currently enrolled in those CTE programs. All teachers are teachers of language. So I want you to think about this quote and just respond in the chat. What does this quote mean and how do you think it applies to CTE programs and instruction? So that CTE teachers need to also teach the language of CTE. Access to content only happens through language. Language is contextual. Excellent. I see reference to, to all courses having its own technical language um, and language that needs to be explicitly taught. And the idea that you can't really separate content from language, right? That we need to be teaching both simultaneously. Excellent. So I'm seeing lots of themes come up here. 
around the importance of teaching both language and content and how those are interconnected and how we all um, need to be collaborating on this topic. So it's important that we define who we're talking about in this webinar. So multilingual learners are students whose parents or guardians report speaking one or more language other than English at home. MLs may or may not qualify for English language development services based on their most current English language proficiency scores. But for the purposes of this webinar, we're really looking specifically at those MLs that do qualify for services. So um, looking at this graph, as of the 2019-20 school year, MLs that qualify for ELD services made up 10.4% of the public school K-12 population. And then at the secondary level, MLs accounted for an average of 6.65% of the public school high school population. And on this map from the U.S. Department of Education, we see that overall there's been significant growth in the ML population nationwide from the 2000-2001 to the 2019-2020 school year. So some states you can see saw more than a 200% increase of MLs over this time period. And now let's focus in on ML representation within CTE programs. So this map comes from Julie Sugarman's 2023 report on MLs equitable access to CTE. So the full report can be found on our Padlet. I really recommend that you check it out. It's got a ton of great information. Um, and as of the 2019-2020 school year, MLs were included in CTE programs at about the same rate as their share of the high school population in most states. There were a few states that you see on the map with some over or under representation, um, but in 39 states, that level of over or under representation was 1% or less. So these findings are really encouraging, um, but the reports don't really provide us data at the local level by school or by district. So it's really important for us to be thinking about our local context, be analyzing that data to see if any over or under representation exists within your school or your district. So I want you to take a moment, um, take a look at this map. What takeaways or thoughts do you have about this map? If you could just share in the chat, what kind of sticks out to you? So some questions about specific states, maybe that have over or under representation, right? And those are the kind of questions that we'd be asking when we're looking at this kind of data at our local level, right? So if we notice a large over or under representation, it's something that would be important for us to investigate. Okay, so let's move on to our next piece. So this infographic from the Office of English Language Acquisition came out in April 2022. And it really highlights the benefits of CTE for MLs, as well as how schools can really support ML participation in CTE programs. So some of the big highlights include that students who participate in CTE graduate from high school at higher rates than those who don't participate. Um, CTE programs prepare MLs for in-demand occupations that pay higher than the national median wage and really have some high growth potential. And then they highlight some recommendations to support equitable access and opportunity in CTE programs for MLs, including providing professional learning to teachers around the needs of MLs and fostering co-planning among ELD and CTE teachers. So CTE classrooms are a really great place to learn language. They include a hands-on approach to learning. It tends to be concrete and provide that immediate relevancy for students. And they provide regular opportunities for that productive talk. So students are working together, they're solving problems, they're creating something. And all of these features of CTE classrooms really can have a positive impact on language acquisition. So we really wanna leverage that for our multilingual learners. And while we know that CTE offers a lot of benefits for our MLs, we do really need to acknowledge that barriers do exist. So before we share um, some of the barriers that we've seen, we'd like to hear from you all in the chat some of the biggest barriers that you've experienced related to CTE for your multilingual learners. So Karen noted awareness, scheduling, we hear that one a lot, scheduling, safety, gatekeeping, technical vocabulary, co-teaching, can be a barrier. We don't have the staffing right, opportunity, not enough core credits yet, right? That scheduling issue for students, maybe some teacher training, industry vocabulary, 
Excellent. So I'm seeing some trends in the chat here um, with um, related to these barriers. So I want to highlight some that have stood out to us, and you guys have really noted most of them that I'm going to share here. So what we've done is, as we've looked at these barriers and, and read some different reports, we've really categorized barriers that we've seen into two categories around recruiting MLs into CTE programs and then retaining them within the CTE programs. So some of those barriers around recruitment include that schools or districts might have specific rules for enrollment into a CTE program. So there might be a minimum grade point average or a prerequisite academic class that could lead to MLs being disproportionately kept out of CTE programs. Um, and we also often hear, just like you put in the chat, that MLs experience a lot of issues really fitting that CTE coursework into their packed schedules, right? Especially our newcomers, they might have a number of core academic classes that they have to complete so that they can get all those um, credits that they need to graduate. So that's a major barrier. The other barriers that we see are related to retaining MLs and CTE programs. And you all spoke to some of these in the chat as well. So if um, CTE programs or classes are held at a different location than the student's homeschool, transportation can become an issue. And then some CTE courses require participation or industry certification fees. So these are some barriers that we have seen, but we want to spend some time talking about ideas for solutions to these barriers. So here we're going to look at some solutions to barriers of recruitment. So we can use trusted staff like our ELD teachers, our counselors, family liaisons to really encourage participation, um, share information with students and families about the benefits of CTE and provide direct support in the application process. We can elevate the voices of current MLCTE students um, with interviews, site visits. We can be really intentional about the use of multilingual outreach. So using written materials, phone calls, social media to reach out and let families and students know about these opportunities. And we can be really strategic about our family and community engagement. So we can leverage some of those special events that are already happening at schools and in the community to advertise through word of mouth, um, provide support to the application process at those events, maybe bring in employers um, with an interest in hiring bilingual staff to those events. So these are just some ideas, but we want to share some ideas that have gone live on the ground. So now Becca is going to share how she's brought some of these ideas to life. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, so in Renton School District, uh, family engagement was a huge piece of the puzzle for us. Um, so this is an outreach event through uh, communities and schools, and we set up a booth with what you see here, this career guide, uh, which we have designed specifically for Renton School District to support all of our families um, in understanding what all of their post-secondary options are. Um, it's also available digitally in our top six represented languages. Uh, but one of the reasons that uh, I pushed my department so much for a focus on community outreach is because of an interaction with uh, this child here in the, in the bottom left of the screen, her name's Natalia, and I've known her since she was three years old. She ran across the field when she saw me. I have 10 years in elementary, um, and so I knew her family as they grew up. And in a conversation with her mother, uh, asking after her older siblings, I told her what my new job was, and she said, oh, what is CTE? I don't know what that is. And I, this just captures my frustration because for her family, CTE would have been a, a really amazing graduation pathway uh, for her older daughter um, who has since graduated and she missed it. Um, and so thinking about how to invite our families and our students into CTE earlier uh, and so that they at least know about these amazing resources, because as Megan mentioned, uh, graduation through a CTE pathway is higher um, than, than graduating through another pathway. So uh, in, in this case, information is absolutely access and it is power. Um, and so making sure that that information is equitable has been a huge uh, driver for our district. Um, another thing that we have done in this multi-pronged effort is to create some early invitation opportunities and activities. So here you see an event called Touch a Career we host this at our preschool campus and all of our students from our amazing CTSOs and clubs and CTE classes plan activities 
uh, for our youngest learners to get their first taste of CTE. So here you see, uh, actually, this is my little boy in the middle, and he is looking at a lamb brain. Um, we had uh, cookie decorating, we had STEM activities, and there are the high school students in those CTE classes to explain from their perspective the power of that experience to our youngest learners and also to our families. We had the career guide there so that teachers, or for, so that family members have in hand um, next step information about what classes are, are available for their students. Um, and then the follow-up from that um, is a series of lessons that we developed for our elementary school students to start them thinking about uh, their futures. Uh, they may end up in a career that they don't, that they've never heard of. They may end up in a career that doesn't yet exist. Uh, but getting the early awareness that they have a beautiful future in front of them and that CTE can help them get there is something that we felt was very important. Uh, research on, um, er, on micro messaging is, can be a little bit demoralizing because what the research says is that some of our youngest learners are receiving messages very early um, that they don't belong in some of these careers, uh, particularly our STEM careers. And so we push back against that narrative with the early invitation. So here you see uh, just a snip from the lesson that includes some STEMs for students to think about um, their future career goals. Um, you'll see that I push students to think about if they haven't thought about what they want to do, they can think about what they definitely don't want to do. I do not mm -hmm. want to be a deep sea diver. That's really important for me to know. And some of the most powerful experiences in CTE, as I'm sure you, you all have all seen with students in classrooms and buildings, is students discovering something that is not for them. Um, so then here you see the, the results of that, all of their thinking, um, and then these, uh, these slips now live at our district office so that all of our staff can see that CTE really can be a pathway and we can give students all the tools that, that they need um, to be in a meaningful and lucrative career in their future. Thank you so much, Becca. So now that we've talked a little bit about recruiting MLs into CTE, we can look at some ideas for solutions to barriers um, of retaining our MLs within CTE programs. So we can provide flexible learning opportunities, provide free transportation to CTE programs that are offsite or even consider a virtual option. And we can focus on ongoing teacher professional development and collaboration. So as you all noted um, in the chat, I think it's really important to acknowledge that fitting CTE into an ML student schedule can be really difficult. Um, and so these are just some ideas that come from Julie Sugarman's report that I referenced earlier around using flexible learning to overcome this barrier. So schools can schedule early morning or evening classes. They can provide work-based learning credit for jobs students already have or consider the use of summer school options. Um, they could offer CTE classes as electives and not part of a sequence, so just a career exploration class. And so as you're looking at these ideas, I think it's really important to consider your individual context and think about who you can collaborate with on this topic. So thinking about what barriers exist in your context and where are there opportunities to leverage some of these suggestions that might work within the constraints of your context. And then teacher training is also really important for retaining our MLs within these CTE programs. We want to be sure that we're really leveraging student strengths and needs as multilingual learners. So to do this, we can plan for and provide professional development and working with MLs, develop scaffolded curricular materials, um, provide opportunities for co-teaching with an ELD teacher, or even use some job embedded coaching. So Becca is going to share how she's brought some of these ideas um, to life within her context. So I come from uh, 10 years as a new teacher trainer and new teacher mentor at the elementary level. And coming into my role in CTE two years ago, I thought I was absolutely up to the task to support new teachers in CTE. Well, as many of you have reflected in the chat, in the chat a lot of teachers coming into CTE come from industry and the need is absolutely completely different. Uh, than a teacher going through a traditional certification pathway. 
And so I learned very quickly that I would need to completely rethink the approach for our new CTE teachers. Uh, so um, as we know, becoming a teacher in CTE has additional barriers because maybe you didn't go through student teaching or go to school for teaching. Perhaps you went from uh, one job on a Friday and into a classroom on a Monday which happened with one of my industry teachers in our computer science classroom this year. Um, the result of that in the research is that turnover is higher for CTE teachers. Uh, turnover is higher still for those teachers who were uh, certificated through alternative licensure pathways. Um, and, and really it's, it's double. It, the turnover is, is uh, twice as high. Uh, and, and this results in some disadvantage that our students experience, uh, because if the turnover is higher, that means that our students are constantly having new teachers and the teachers with the least amount of training. Uh, in my district, what that um, where that manifests is in our students' data for industry-recognized credentials. So some of you referenced the barriers coming up with industry-recognized credentials and what languages they may or may not be available in. Uh, industry-recognized credentials can be an amazing tool for equity for our students, but our ELL students are 30 to 35% less likely to attain those industry-recognized credentials than our non-ML students. Um, so thinking about the training for our new CTE teachers, it becomes all the more urgent um, that we prepare them with the tools that they need to support all learners really meaningfully from the first day they're in the, in the classroom. Um, and that's a really difficult ask. Uh, so we look at teacher induction from a really cohesive approach, uh, thinking about the hiring, the orientation, mentoring, professional learning, and building support as a really cohesive structure. Uh, in Washington State, uh, we are a part of the BEST grant. That's the Beginning Educator Support Team. Uh, and so our state has put out a set of induction practices that specifically speak to uh, how we should be handling teacher induction. Um, and so I would really encourage you um, if you support CTE, new CTE teachers in any way, even if it's just being down the hallway from them uh, and being a listening ear and a champion, um, to partner with other departments, to break down the silos, to get your director, your principal, your uh, human resource specialist to understand um, this, this additional and really nuanced challenge of being a CTE teacher, especially in the first and second year. Um, so that we can retain these teachers long enough for them to feel some efficacy in the classroom. Um, thinking about our induction model in Renton, I've stepped it up a little bit from what Washington State suggests. And so this is how I run things in, in the department. I, uh, we, have, we are lucky enough to have a three-day new hire orientation. Uh, which includes topics like formative assessment and universal design for learning. Uh, and for some of our industry teachers, that is like an advanced course. And we need to step it back, maybe do some improv, uh, talk about what a lesson plan is, practice uh, teaching from a PowerPoint. And so I take all of our CTE first and second year teachers, I've got 12 this year, and run a separate a new hire orientation that addresses some of those basics. Uh, we pair that with weekly mentor meetings, weekly observation with written feedback, um, a, a monthly professional learning series, full day release for observations, because some of them go into CTE classrooms uh, having never watched instruction in, an, in a high school classroom since they themselves received that. Um, and, and actually for a lot of our teachers, as you all know, uh, we would like to provide our, our students a different experience than they may have had in their own high school classroom or middle school classroom. Um, and then one other thing that we work hard to do in Renton is to collaborate with our evaluators uh, so that they deeply understand the needs of our new CTE teachers and also so that uh, the, the coaches and mentors can really calibrate and make sure that we are providing the support that is going to have that, that really nice um, coupling of support with pressure. Um, 
I think a, a disservice that often happens to our new teachers is that they receive evaluation feedback that they're not um, they're not doing well in November or December, which feels really late and it's really hard to dig out of that hole. So by uh, providing new teachers with really honest and supportive and encouraging feedback weekly, uh, my teachers can have you know five observations and debriefs with me by the time their evaluator comes into the room. Uh, so that's one of the things that we really focus on strongly. Uh, in the professional learning series, um, ours also looks a little bit different than uh, the professional learning series for our uh, non-alternatively certificated teachers, our teachers outside of CTE, uh, because I embed uh, PSYOP into that training. So this is the PSYOP for, you know, those of you who don't know that particular acronym, I know education is full of acronyms. That's the Sheltered Instruction Observation Protocol, which is simply a framework for teaching um, all learners and uh, specifically uh, multilingual learners. So you can see here, this is my schedule for uh, trainings for the year. And I have, um, I have woven in the components of the SIOP framework into that training so that by the end of the year, all of my CTE teachers have received that comprehensive training. Um, let's see. Yes, I, I'm glad to see that PSYOP training is embedded too. It's made a big difference. Um, and I can tell you just um, one anecdote from the impact that it has made. Uh, in this PSYOP introduction in September, I muddled my way through uh, teaching a lesson in Spanish. My Spanish is not great. It's okay. Um, but I taught a lesson in Spanish so that my teachers could see me model some um some strategies that I was going to be teaching them. And um, one really unexpected result from that is that teachers reflected how they felt uh, because none of them in the room were Spanish speakers. Um, and, and they felt really, um, they felt isolated, they felt alone um, and, and they didn't feel like, they didn't feel smart. And they grew an immediate sense of compassion for how some of the students in their classrooms may be feeling. Um, so that was a really beautiful and, and unanticipated consequence. Um, so um, that is just one way that you could embed more support for your CTE teachers that is specifically related to multilingual learners. Um, and I think that that I, I throw it back to you, Meg. Thank you so much, Becca. Um, thank you for sharing like such a robust teacher training model that you have. It's, it's so great to hear about that. And so now that we've heard about this, we want to get a sense from all of you um, what do you see as the greatest advocacy need in your context related to CTE and MLs? So we're going to launch a poll here in just a second. Um, is it access to CTE, student recruitment, scheduling, appropriate instruction, or teacher training? I see that some of you uh, mentioned scheduling, Joanne, so that was a big one, but let's move into the strategies. So we promised to share five instructional strategies for supporting MLs um, within CTE programs. So those five strategies are to embed peer learning opportunities into instruction, to incorporate explicit vocabulary development into instruction, provide writing support based on individual student strengths and needs, including academic language mini lessons, and then preparing students for those certification exams using multiple modalities. And so within each of these strategies, we're embedding scaffolds. So when I mention scaffolds, uh, when we look at scaffolding for MLs, it's really important that we acknowledge that scaffolds should be temporary supports. So we wanna provide that comprehensible input to students, support them with performing a task that they couldn't do without help, um, because using these scaffolds really facilitate students in being able to complete those tasks independently in the future. So that's the goal of scaffolding. And here you see a table of three different categories of scaffolds, and this is available on the Padlet. So we have instructional materials scaffolds. So those are the audio, visual, and hands-on materials like graphic organizers and visuals. 
um, instructional practices scaffolds are those teacher moves that really support understanding and engagement like wait time and activating prior knowledge. And then instructional grouping scaffolds. So those are those intentional student groupings like pair work or teacher-led small group work. So this resource is available on the Padlet. There's also an example of Becca adding scaffolds to a lesson plan. But as we go through these strategy recommendations, know that we um, that we should be adding in scaffolds based on ML's individual strengths and needs. So our first strategy recommendation is the use of peer learning. So peer learning are those oral language activities that require students to interact with each other and discuss ideas. The benefit of peer learning is that students have an opportunity to really hear and practice that discipline specific language to support them in learning the content. And those interactions really provide opportunities for repetition of language, which supports language acquisition, learning of academic language and literacy development. And it also enhances content learning and retention because students are able to talk about and think about content in a lot of different ways. So now let's look at a couple of examples of what this might look like in a CTE classroom. So here we see a research project in a, a middle school family and consumer science classroom. They were studying fast fashion. Um, and so here you see just an artifact from that classroom. One of the things that I really liked about this particular assignment is that it wove in some opportunities for student choice. Uh, so stu the group decided on four questions to research. Each of them completed one quadrant of the poster. They did a gallery walk to look at what other students had done, and then uh, students presented their posters. So really um, rich opportunity to collaborate, uh, agree and disagree with each other, uh, and then present to the class and, and feel that opportunity a little bit more formally. Um, many of you are familiar with um, a KWL chart. Um, here's an, an example of one that a teacher just used sticky notes to do. Um, and so she did a turn and talk about what students knew about the topic of entrepreneurship. They wrote that on a sticky note and then um, she just collected them and put them onto a poster. She repeated that step with what they wanted to know. And then she made a really lovely move, which is that uh, as as she went through her uh, content and language objectives throughout uh, the term, uh, she would refer back to the chart and start to highlight it, mark it off, orienting students to the knowledge and learning that they were developing. Um, and that helped her build a really lovely through line uh, for students as they went through um, their, their learning about entrepreneurship. And then this poster lived in their classroom and they added a final section uh, as sort of a recap at the end of, of their learning experience. Excellent. So then our next strategy recommendation is around an explicit focus on vocabulary development. And it sounds like a lot of you chose that one um, in the poll. So CTE courses include a ton of technical language, right? And it's really important that we use student-friendly definitions when we introduce technical vocabulary, include visuals and realia whenever we can. And we want to go beyond just teaching the meaning of a word and really provide instruction on how to use those words in context and give students time to practice using the words in authentic ways. So we want to give them opportunities to use the words in speaking, writing, listening, and reading. So now let's look at a couple of examples. So this example comes from uh, the world of cosmetology, but you could do this with any content area. Um, and, and this is sort of a, a double purpose here because I, as an instructional coach, have gone into a lot of classrooms um, that are a little boring, uh, where a teacher is giving a set of vocabulary words and students are writing down the definitions, um, which really doesn't foster a whole lot of authentic engagement. Um, and so this flips the script. You give students uh, a bank of words. They can break off either into teams or individually work to collectively create um, a set of vocabulary words that they then are the teachers of for the class. Um, so let's see. And then they present again, as Megan mentioned, getting all of those opportunities to read, write, listen, and speak. Um, we've got another example here. Uh, from the same family consumer science classroom uh, that the fast fashion um, 
learning came from. And Megan, it's not advancing for me. Would you mind advancing the slide for me? Thank you so much. Um, this was a, an opportunity where a teacher actually front loaded the vocabulary for her newcomer multilingual learners before reviewing the vocabulary as a class. So you see a graphic organizer that the teacher prepared and sent with the student uh, to a pull out multilingual learner um, class for newcomers. The student researched the uh, sewing specific words. They wrote down the word uh, in their home language and then they shared with the class um, their, uh, their home language uh, vocabulary once those words were introduced. Uh, one of the things that this teacher later shared with me is that she ran into a barrier uh, because some of her students were not literate in their home language. Um, and so uh, this was actually a beautiful problem of practice for a PLC of, of new CTE teachers. And another CTE teacher uh, suggested that she use a free photo translation app so that the student could um, take a picture of that picture and it would speak the word to them in their home language. Um, so thinking about those ways to just front load information, invite students into what they already know about the topic um, and work with your uh, multilingual learner teachers in your, in your school and district to support students in that way. And back to you, Megan. Great. So our next strategy is around writing support. We often hear um, teachers report a need for strategies to support MLs in the domain of writing. And so in CTE courses, students are required to write for a variety of purposes, right? There might be technical writing, composing emails, developing a resume. So to really prepare students to be successful writers, CTE teachers can incorporate explicit writing lessons with appropriate scaffolds. So to do this, we want to think about what we're asking students to write and find high quality exemplars that we can analyze with students um, before asking them to engage in that writing. And we really wanna consider individual student strengths and needs, their proficiency levels, in order to determine appropriate scaffolds. So do we need to use sentence frames? Do we need graphic organizers or a paragraph frame to support students in composing these writing um, tasks? So we're going to look at an example from a criminal justice course. So in this example, students are tasked with writing an essay on four types of cyber crimes, and the teacher provides students with text to gather information on those various cyber crimes. And some of the texts are adapted for students at lower proficiency levels with the addition of visuals, bolding of keywords, um, a bilingual dictionary. And then to support MLs in gathering that information for the essay, the teacher provides them with a graphic organizer and has them work collaboratively in pairs to conduct that research before writing independently. And then once students get to the point where they're composing their essay, the teacher provides some sample sentence frames and sentence starters like you see on the screen and students use them as a guide, but they're really encouraged also to write some of their own sentences. And the teacher models how to use these frames and starters with students before asking them to do so independently. So you'll notice in the example here that some of the words are in blue um, to, to let the students know the type of word or phrase that should go in the blank there. And then once students have these sentences, it's really helpful for the teacher to support students and model how to transition these sentences into a cohesive paragraph. And then our next strategy recommendation is the use of academic language mini lessons. So some multilingual learners might need support producing and processing some language structures that might be unfamiliar to them. And language mini lessons really provide an opportunity to teach that new or unfamiliar language. So these mini lessons, they're brief lessons. They can be full class or small group, depending on the needs of your class. And the teacher would identify topics for the mini lesson based on the language demands of the lesson or the unit, um, informative assessments, classroom observations that are happening. So let's look at some examples of what this might look like. So here, this is an example from a health occupations course. So there's a lot of medical terms that consist of three parts, right? The root word, prefix, and suffix. So by learning those more common ones, 
we can help students be able to understand unfamiliar medical terms in the future. So teachers can use many lessons to really introduce the concept of root words, prefixes, and suffixes to students. And Becca has another great example of what this can look like. Yeah, so this one came out of a computer science classroom. As, as some of you mentioned in the chat, uh, we are uh, teachers of language, and some of that language is very technical. I um, mean, in the world of computer science, that could be C++, Java, Python, block code. Um, and so this is an example of an activity uh, that a computer science teacher did to support her uh, her students to understand what the uh, the if then else uh, language was all about, and so first the teacher introduced if then else, uh, and then they they explored that structure in a non academic way as you see here. If it is raining, then use an umbrella, or else don't use an umbrella, um, and that supported students to more um, easily understand the the function. Uh, so that they could translate that into code um, and and not only producing that code, but also reading, um, maybe revising and finding errors as well. So this one is our final strategy recommendation, which is around exam preparation. Um, so we know that for a lot of CTE programs, students have to pass industry certification exams to be able to work in their field of study once they graduate. And, you know, those requirements vary by industry and state, of course, but it's still important that we support our MLs in preparing for these exams. So providing students time to practice and engage with both the language of the exam and the exam structure. So to do that, um, teachers can collaborate to really review exam materials that are released um, to analyze the language demands of the test. And then once you've analyzed those demands, coming up with activities where students are able to practice with that key vocabulary and those language structures that they'll encounter, as well as the question types, whether it be a practical scenario or a multiple choice question, and really making sure that we're doing that um, using multiple modalities. So not just having students you know, drill and kill with uh, multiple choice questions, but having them engage with their peers, talk about the questions, use the language, right, across modalities, listening, speaking, reading, and writing. So Beck is going to share some ideas for how you might analyze the language um, to do that. So item analysis uh, is something that you can do with a PLC, uh, with a professional learning community, or you could do with students as a lesson. Um, so I'm going to focus first on how you could use that in a PLC. So if you can get your hands on any quality assessment that your students use, it could be one of those industry recognized credentials like OSHA is provided as an example here. Um, if you uh, are an IB school, it could be a released items from an IB assessment or an AP assessment. And then take that assessment with your team, analyze it together, identify what students need to know uh, and understand in order to be successful. Um, and, and one of the things that I talk to teachers a lot about is that this doesn't mean that you are preparing to teach to the test, but rather you are teaching what is tested, um, that you are ensuring through your own collaborative work that you're giving students every opportunity to um, digest the content that they will be tested on. Um, as an activity for students, you could put an item up. This could be like a weekly routine, analyze the item together pick apart the structures, pick apart some of the distractors, um, you know, item assessment, you can play like a assessment writer and, and have them identify like, where's the trick? Where's the misconception that the person who wrote this item put in to get you? Um, and in that way, we're giving students more opportunities to be successful on those really important industry recognized credentials in addition to some of the other standardized assessments that students are going to need to take. So thank you so much, Becca. And when we think about how we're going to practice with this language, we have a couple of what I think are pretty fun examples of how you can do this. Um, so this example is an activity called Roll a Word. So this is really to get students practice with that key vocabulary they might see on an exam. So in this activity, students are working in small groups and they're really using the words in context. Um, so students will work in small groups and they have these word cards like you see on the screen. And one student in the group would pick a word card and then roll a die and respond to the prompt that corresponds to the number that they rolled. And the other group members would then determine if the answer is correct. And they would continue this 
rolling up the die and practicing with the different vocabulary words, you know, until the time is up. And it really provides students with that opportunity to use the vocabulary cross modalities. They're reading, they're listening, they're speaking throughout. And depending on the needs of your students, you can embed more scaffolds, right? You can have images on these word cards. You can provide sentence frames that support each prompt. You could even have an answer key with definitions so the other group members could refer to that um, to help them kind of analyze whether or not that, that answer is correct. And then this is an example for really practicing with those question types. So this is an activity we call task cards. So like I said, this is an opportunity to practice with the question types. So it might be multiple choice questions like you see on the screen. It might be open-ended questions. It might be a practical scenario, but students are practicing these one prompt at a time. And so for this activity, you could have students working in pairs or small groups. Students choose a task card from the pile, they read it aloud, and then they discuss the potential responses um, and they talk about their thinking, describe why they believe a certain answer is correct, and then they come to agreement on the response. You could have them have a note-taking sheet where they're recording their responses, and then they continue to work through those task cards. Then you can pull students back together as a whole group and go through some of those key questions um, as a class. And so that brings us to the end of our strategy recommendation. Which strategy do you think is gonna be most beneficial for MLs in your context? So you could just put one, two, three, four, or five. So vocabulary writing, peer learning, language mini lessons for exam preparation. So I'm seeing lots of ones, vocabulary, peer-to-peer -peer learning. One seems to be dominating, but the chat is going very fast. Excellent. So I'm seeing some twos and fives, but a whole lot of ones. Okay, great. Thank you all so much. I'm excited to see five like coming as a runner up there. Some people mm -hmm. thinking about item analysis and exam prep. Excellent. So that brings us to our wrap up and our reflection. So here we're just going to set a goal for effective CTE programming and instruction for MLs in your context. So what we're going to do here is in the chat, if you could just share an action that you're going to take as a result of this webinar. So maybe it's related to programming, maybe it's related to instruction. What is an action that you'd like to take based on this webinar? So share some of these with CTE teachers, with administrators. Somebody said, I'm already texting my co-teacher. Awesome. <laughs> They're going too fast for me to read them all aloud, but I'm seeing lots about collaborating and sharing, which is great. Um, I think collaboration is a huge piece of this, and Becca's talked about that as well. Um, so we're excited that we see lots of um next steps that you all will take to bring this to life. And our, our goals for the webinar today were to discuss that urgency around creating equitable pathways for ML enrollment in CTE programs and supporting MLs currently enrolled in CTE programs. We are exploring five instructional strategy recommendations to advance MLs equitable participation in CTE, and then set a goal, which is what you're all doing now, for effective CTE programming and instruction for MLs in your context. And so I think we were able to achieve all three of those goals today. We just want to thank you all so much for coming, um, engaging with us on this topic. We're so excited to have this webinar um, and we're thrilled with the amount of participants that we have and the interest in this topic. So you see our contact information there on the screen. Feel free to connect with us. We'd love to talk to you more about how you're supporting MLs within CTE in your context. Everyone have a great night.